Good morning. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mrs. Heidekevich or Mrs. H. I'm a science teacher, a dorm parent, and PBA, and I live on campus. While most chapel talks start with a baby picture, I wanted to share something different with you. This one was taken by Mr. Moshe while we were in Roatan just a few weeks ago, and I'm going to treasure it forever. I had no idea that he was taking a picture at that time. And what he doesn't know is that he captured a moment of pure joy and gratitude for me. You see, that day, that dive, was on January 16th. That is the day that I celebrated 10 years of sobriety. The moment he captured was a minute I took to myself to just stretch out over the reef, taking it all in, so thankful for these last 10 years and realizing that what I was doing and how I was feeling would not have been possible if I had not given up drinking 10 years before. I'm pretty sure I would also not be here with you today if I had not quit drinking, and I'm so thankful I'm here to share my story with you. I do want to start by saying I'm not here to lecture you about drinking. I know that doesn't work. I certainly heard my share of lectures about substance abuse growing up. That did not change my own decision making. I'm here to tell you about my own experience with it and how it affected my life and my family. Last week we heard from Angie and she spoke about working toward breaking stigmas associated with mental health. I think it's really important that we talk about these issues, whether it's depression or anxiety or addiction, so that we can all become more comfortable when we need to ask others for help. I wish I had been more comfortable about talking about it. Maybe I would have gotten help sooner. So I was raised in a really loving household. I grew up in Harvard, Mass., a small town about 45 minutes outside of Boston. I had a textbook, Great Family Life. My parents are still together. We went to church every Sunday, went on cool vacations, did family dinners. However, I also come from a very long line of high-functioning alcoholics. What that means is that the alcoholics in my family, generations and generations of them, never lost their jobs, never got arrested. They were very successful business people, lawyers, doctors, moms, and socialites. Their drinking was the family secret. <clears throat> we never talked about it, but you knew that you never called grandma after 7 p.m. because she'd probably be really mean and she wouldn't remember the conversation the next day. I was warned over and over again that alcoholism ran in the family, that I'd have to be more vigilant about watching my own drinking, but none of those warnings mattered because I still ended up in the same place as those who came before me. I pray every day I have ended the cycle, but you just don't know. So Harvard was a really small town. My high school was the size of Brooks and there was nothing to do there, literally nothing. No movies, no restaurants, not even a traffic light in the beginning, in the middle of town. Out of boredom, we started drinking young. I had my first drink in seventh grade. The first time I really drank, I was in ninth grade. I chugged vodka, blacked out, and was brought home in the back of a police car. Even after that horrible night, after scaring and disappointing my parents and suffering through months of guilt and punishment, I continued to drink all through high school and college. I never really felt comfortable in my own skin socially, so I drank. All the kids who were in my friend group drank, and I wanted to fit in. I was never peer pressured by my friends, but I pressured myself to drink, thinking it would help me be more comfortable in social situations, which often felt really awkward to me. I actually didn't even like the taste of alcohol, but I would pretend to just to be like everybody else. What I learned pretty early in my drinking is that I am what is called a blackout drinker. That means that when I drank, I blacked out and would not have memories from the night before. It's a pretty terrifying thing to wake up and not know what you've done or where you've been. And really awful things can happen when you are in a blackout. You see, when someone is in a blackout, they're not unconscious. That's passed out. Blackout is different. They might appear very drunk, but they're still functioning. However, the next day they will have gaps in their memory from the night before, and it's a really scary feeling. The way I've explained it to others is that it's almost like an allergic reaction. Everyone responds to alcohol differently. 
For me, that response almost always included blacking out and also being unable to stop drinking like other people. My body reacts differently than other people's, and that's why I know I can never take another drink ever again. It really wasn't until I was in my 30s that my drinking got really bad. To everyone in my Andover neighborhood, at my job, at my church, I was a typical baseball mom and loving wife. I was a CCD teacher at my church. I was a respected high school teacher. What started as drinking a glass of wine every night turned into a few glasses and then bottles of wine or whatever I could find in the house. I hid this from everyone, drinking alone after my family had gone to sleep. Every night, I would drink myself into a blackout, and every morning, I would wake up deeply ashamed of myself. I could not even look at myself in the mirror because I carried so much guilt about what I was doing. My drinking was affecting my family. My kids knew that I could never be the mom to pick them up late night from friends' houses because I was probably passed out on the couch. They were embarrassed by me because I would slur my words and be really clumsy in front of their friends. My son once said to my sister, my friends think it's funny because my mom always falls down when she's been drinking. People in my life were concerned about me because I was having a harder and harder time hiding my drinking, but I was not willing to give it up. Every morning, I'd promise myself that I wouldn't drink that day, and then I'd fail. And this just made my guilt and my shame grow and grow, which made me drink even more to try and forget that I'd let everyone including myself, down again. It was actually this job, this place, that caused me to finally get help. I'd been working at Brooks for about two years, and I wanted to live on campus and be a dorm parent, but I knew that if I lived here, my secret would be found out. I was terrified that I would lose this job, which would also mean losing my kids' education and the community I had grown to love. One day, I was asked to sit in on a DC for students who'd been caught drinking. As I sat there, listening to this one terrified, tearful girl, I felt the full weight of my hypocrisy. I thought, who am I to be passing judgment on this kid? I'm a mess. At that moment, I gave up. I surrendered. I realized that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. In Alcoholics Anonymous, the place I sought help, we call it the first step. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. I left that DC, went to a trusted friend, told her I needed help. I admitted to her and then my family and my doctor just how bad my drinking had gotten. I was terrified, but I knew it had to end. 10 years ago, my life changed drastically because I finally got the help I needed to quit drinking. I started going to AA meetings. I got a sober sponsor to help me and surrounded myself with other people in recovery who could understand what I was going through. It was like a thousand pounds had been lifted off my shoulders. The shame, the embarrassment, the self-hatred were gone. I am grateful every day for my sobriety. Because of it, I became the mom, the wife, the teacher, the friend, the dorm parent that I had been pretending to be for so many years. Today, if my kids need me at two o'clock in the morning, I'm there for them. If you need me at two o'clock in the morning, I can be there for you. I have to take a little water, <laughs> sorry. Mm. Okay, I could not have said that before I quit drinking. I'd put alcohol ahead of the things that mattered most to me. I'd put it ahead of myself. And 10 years ago, I finally put myself first and I'm grateful every day that I did. That picture, that shows a person who's free, free from the weight of addiction. If there's one thing I hope you take from my talk today, it's that addiction can strike anyone. I'm certain there's people in this room with a friend or family member struggling with addiction, or maybe even struggling themselves, or who are okay now, but for whom it becomes a concern in the future. There are tons of resources out there and here. The Health Center, Ms. Craddy, your advisor, the peer advisors, and other adults in this community are here to help. I am here if you want to talk about it anytime. Just know that whatever your relationship is to this issue, you are not alone. Addiction can be life or death. It can destroy lives and families. 
It could have destroyed mine, and I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gotten honest about my problem. It is time we really talk about it. And because I want more than anything to remove shame and stigma around this issue so that anyone who needs help can get it, I'll end with the mantra I repeat every Monday at my AA meeting and will for the rest of my life. My name is Laura, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you.